Uh, chapter 17b. Um, this chapter is probably the hardest chapter we do. At least that's what some of my students have told me in the past. So we'll take just the basic part of this chapter today. Uh, so I've already posted on Canvas the 17b lecture slides, uh, which are more complete than this, and I really recommend that you look at those thoroughly. But uh, today I'm just going to talk about the main points of this chapter because otherwise we'll be here for three hours. So um, I'm probably only going to go for about an hour or maybe an hour and a half at the most. And we're just going to talk about the basics of this chapter. Uh, so one of the things that's different about this chapter as far as the notes are concerned is that uh, the Brown and LeMay series that they sent out of PowerPoints, I mean, al already sketchy enough. In this particular chapter, I think there were like a total of five slides. Uh, and it's just, I mean, it, it was useless. <clears throat> so what I had to do is I had to go online and I found a guy who had a set of slides, and this was years ago, uh, Jan USA or something like that. And it wasn't really very good, but it was better than nothing. Uh, and it gave me something to start with. And, and some of the stuff was good, but it's just that the way he had it formatted was just crazy. Uh, so he had, I mean, like, you'd have to see it to believe how he had all different colors, pink, purple, uh, all different font sizes and, and styles. <clears throat> and it was, it was just hard to read it. Uh, so, and it took me years to finally go through it little by little to get it to the way it looks now. Uh, but it's different from the other slide sets in that it, it's formatted differently, at least part of it is. So anyway, uh, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and go through this. Just the main points, uh, the things that I think you're going to see on the final, basically, and also the things that I'll stress on the exam. Uh, the next exam will cover this chapter and chapter 19 only, only two chapters. Uh, so, it, you know, hopefully that'll make it a little bit easier and a little bit better. So this chapter is talking about what happens when you dissolve things uh, in water. And so before we start, let me just mention that, and I think I've mentioned this in the past, when we do problems up to this point in the chapter, uh, in the course, uh, we've been using salts that are soluble, and we'll find out what that means in just a minute. Uh, we haven't been using insoluble salts up to this point, other than in 1311 when you learned about precipitates. And you, you decided, well, you know, for example, silver chloride, uh, cl chlorines, chlorides, bromides, and iodides are soluble, except if they come in contact with silver, mercury, and lead. So, for example, if a silver bumps into a chloride, then they precipitate out. But other than that, we really haven't dealt with any problems where you would add a salt to a solution that was not soluble. And we assumed that it would completely diso dissolve or dissociate. Uh, so this chapter will be introduced to salts that don't do that, like silver chloride. So let me, I'm going to click. Now, every time I click a slide, I'll say click. So here are the big deals. I'm not going to cover number six, number seven, uh, number 10, and number nine. But you should look them over. So they're still in your, they're in your lecture notes. So take a look at those on your own. If you have questions, just email. But uh, I don't think that we need to go through these in this, in this uh, video. So I'm going to go ahead and click over to the next slide. And these are the things that we are going to talk about in this video. So uh, learning how the solubility products work uh, and then uh, learning two different techniques. One to find a solubility product if we know the solubility or alternatively and in, in the reverse order find the solubility given the solubility product. Uh, and then there are ways that we can either increase or decrease the solubility. To increase the solubility, uh, we can do the things in number four there, uh, which would be add an acid when the product is a conjugate base of a weak acid, or add a ligand to produce a complex ion, which we'll talk more about that in just a little while. Uh, and then to decrease the solubility, uh, we can add a common ion, and that's done sometimes in 
certain instances where you can actually cause something to basically precipitate out completely. If you have something that's a precipitate and you want to decrease the solubility even more, add a common ion. Okay, so that, that's what we're going to cover. I'm going to click to the next slide. All right, so again, as I said earlier, uh, I had to take Jan, who says material offline, and so I gave him credit here. Uh, also in the slides, I gave him credit, uh, not plagiarizing, just I took his slides and then did a ton of work to try to get them up to the place where they are now. Uh, and so I'm going to click to the next slide. Solubility, next slide. So uh, when we put sugar in something like coffee or tea, it's a covalent compound, right? Uh, the reason that co coffee will dissolve sugar is because uh, even though it takes energy to break up the sugar molecules and it takes energy to break up the water molecules, when the sugar dissolves, more energy is expended than it takes total to break those up from the other two things. So the net is that the energy is going to be lower if you have the solution than it would be if they're separated. And that's why it goes ahead and goes forward. So uh, this is for covalent compounds. Now, what we want to talk about in this chapter, though, is ionic compounds and how they dissolve. So let's flip to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Next. For ionic solids, we have a little bit of a different situation. So when we put an ionic solid uh, or salt into water, uh, typically they will break up to some extent because what happens is the water is polar and so the partial positives on the water will attract the negative ions. Like for example, for sodium chloride, they would attract the chloride minus. Uh, for the positive ions like the sodium plus, they would be attracted by the negative or partially negative part of the water molecule. So usually, with only a few exceptions, things will dissolve in water. <clears throat> not, not. I mean, I say a few exceptions. That It depends on how you look at it. Because actually, there are a lot of salts that don't break up very much. Uh, all right, uh, so let's go ahead and move on. Next slide. Uh, and uh, so if you look at the bottom, it says eventually if you put sodium chloride in water, the uh, sodium and chloride will continue to break up until you have so much of it that's dissolved that it will eventually it will get to a point where it will start to reassimilate back into sodium chloride solid. So you'll have some of it that's dissolving and some of it that's uh, re, re uh, constituting sodium chloride. So some of it is dissolving, some of it's dropping back down into the bottom. And when it does that, uh, we say that it's at equilibrium. But the thing is, is like for sodium chloride, it's so soluble that you have to dump a ton of it into water before you reach that point. Uh, I think I calculated just very briefly in my head that uh, the concentration you would have to have of sodium chloride would have to be about 6 molar. Uh, don't hold me to that but uh, it would have to be a gigantic concentration. So basically it's useless to try to do these kinds of calculations for something like sodium chloride because you would have to put so much in. As opposed to the things that we'll be talking about in this chapter like silver chloride where you just put a little bit of it in and it's already at equilibrium. Uh, so next slide. Uh, so it's at the bottom again. These rules are going to be based on the following definitions of the terms soluble, insoluble, and slightly soluble. Uh, I'm going to pause this for one minute. I've got to take care of something. I'll be right back. Right, okay. Uh, at the bottom again, we're dividing these three kinds of salts into soluble, insoluble, and slightly soluble. So let's click to the next slide. Let's take a look here at what the differences are. So. Uh, a salt at the top is soluble if it dissolves more than 0 0.1 molar. And as I've mentioned, uh, most of the things or all of the things really that we've dealt with to this point would fall in this category. Uh, 
then in the middle, a salt is insoluble if it's less than 0.001. Now, it depends, uh, but just to back up, it's less than 001 molar. So compare that to soluble, which is more than 0.1. Uh, so if it's less than 001 molar, then we say that it's insoluble. And then if it's in between those two, if it's between 0.001 and 0.1, then we say that it's slightly soluble. And we'll come back to this in the work problems and talk a little bit more. Uh, so basically what we're dealing with in this chapter will be something that's less than 0.1 molar. Uh, so we'll be talking about things that would be considered either insoluble on this slide or slightly soluble. Next slide. Okay, so here are the solubility rules from 1311. Uh, I'm not going to read over them again. You should have these in your memory from that class. Uh, so if you want to take a look at these, you can. Uh, but this is where these rules that we used in 1311 came from, the things that we're talking about here. Next slide. All right, so again, when a salt is soluble, we say uh, that relatively large quantities of the salt have to be added. In other words, as we were mentioning, for sodium chloride, you have to add a lot of salt, sodium chloride salt, to get that to equilibrium. But now, if you look at the bottom paragraph, on the other hand, if the salts are very slightly soluble or insoluble, then we can easily achieve equilibrium. As soon as we put the salt in the water, it basically will come to equilibrium because it only takes a little tiny bit of it to dissolve to get it to the point where you've got as much going into solution as you do coming out of solution. So basically, uh, just add a certain amount of solid to the water and you're there. Next slide. So the things that we're going to be talking about in this chapter, the solubility product constants, are very relevant for the things that we are calling insoluble. They're not relevant at all for things like sodium chloride. So I put all of these slides in here to try to point that out, that uh, the, the, there's a reason why we're doing this chapter, and that's to be able to talk about salts that we haven't talked about before, basically. So, and it turns out that because they're not soluble particularly, lit, that um, we can do special problems with them that we couldn't do otherwise. Uh, the equilibrium problem, so because they come to equilibrium so quickly, uh, we can do problems that depend on the fact that they are at equilibrium. Now remember that we've talked about several equilibrium constants, like just the basic KC and KP constants, uh, and then we also talked about KA and KB. So we're going to keep going from there. So uh, we'll be talking about constants that are called K sub SP, where the SP stands for solubility product. Uh, next slide. Okay, so when we utilize, I'm just going to read this, a solubility product constant, which we are going to abbreviate as KSP, it will involve a situation where there is an equilibrium present between the solid, which is dissociating, and the dissolved ions, which are reassociating. Next slide. Uh, okay, so I've already talked about this, so let's go to the next slide. All right, so these are the two main kinds of problems, and these are also going to be the most likely things to see on the final exam. So if you think about it, the final exam has 35 multiple choice questions, of which we have about 10 chapters, which means each chapter will only donate about three or four questions. So the most likely thing to see from this chapter is going to be what we're looking at right here on this slide. Uh, calculating the constant, the KSP, from a solubility that we know. Now, when they say solubility, they mean concentration or molarity. So try to fix it in your mind right now for the rest of the semester that when they say solubility, that's synonymous with saying molarity or concentration. Uh, but we don't see that word solubility as much, so you'll have to get used to it. 
But if we know what the concentration is, then we can figure out what the K is and vice versa. So number two is just the opposite. So these two types of questions are just going in reverse directions. We'll see that in just a minute. Next slide. So first of all, the solubility product, what is it? Uh, so KSPs are when we have a saturated solution. That means when, and that's another term that means kind of the same thing. If it's saturated, that means you're at equilibrium. It means that no more salt can dissolve. So uh, it's another way of saying we're at equilibrium. And of course, you can't have an equilibrium constant if you're not at equilibrium, whether it's Ka or Kb or whatever. Uh, all right, let's next slide. Oh, before we move. One other thing, the equilibrium, notice, notice at the bottom, the equilibrium does not depend upon the amount of solid. Now, this is kind of hard to understand, but what it means is that, for example, for silver chloride or something like that, it doesn't make any difference whether you put a little bit of it in the water or a lot of it. You're still going to get the same equilibrium because there's only going to be such a tiny amount that will dissolve in that amount of water. So if you wanted to change how much dissolves, you wouldn't dump more of the silver chloride and you'd put more water in, right? Okay, next slide. Um, and uh, all right, so at the very bottom in bold, solubility is defined as the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in a solvent at equilibrium. Next slide. Uh, in the middle, uh, when we say something is insoluble, it does not mean it's zero. Uh, some of the salts that we're going to deal with today uh, have solubilities that are like ri ridiculously low numbers, like uh, 1 times 10 to the minus 15th molar. But nevertheless, even though that number is so small, it's not zero. Uh, but it is less than 0. Uh, 0, 0 one or whatever definition you want to use. Uh, so it's considered to be insoluble. But even though it says it's completely, it sounds like it's completely zero soluble, but it isn't. And we'll see that later. Next slide. OK, so we're going to use this salt, calcium oxalate, uh, for the rest of this chapter. So uh, let's take a look at what it is. So if you take off, if, if you look at the top line, it says, calcium oxalate and then it gives you CaC2O4. Remove the Ca from that and just look at the C2O4. Now we know calcium as an ion would be Ca2 plus, right? Uh, so that means that that C2O4, C2O4 has to have a negative two charge on it and that's a, an actual charge. So what that is, and I've got the structure on one of the, the following slides, but it's like if you have an, an acid group in organic chemistry, that would be COOH. It's C double bonded to an O, and it's single bonded to another O, and then the other bond off the carbon would be going to the R group that we talked about. Uh, and then uh, you would have an H on the other O, the O that's single bonded. Okay, so in this case, what oxalic acid, so oxalate here, this C2O4 minus, if you look down at that reaction, the equilibrium, it's got a C2O4 2 minus on the right hand side. That is oxalate. So oxalic acid would be with that same thing that would have two H's attached to it. In other words, it would be COOH back to back with another COOH. So here what we have is a situation where the COOH back to back with COOH has donated both of its uh, protons, its H's. So what's left over is actually the conjugate base of a weak acid, which is oxalic acid. Uh, and we'll come back to that later in the slideshow. Uh, so anyway, back to this, we have Ca2 plus, C2O4, 2 minus. Okay, when you put it in water, uh, it is a, an insoluble salt, but it will break up a little bit into a little bit of Ca2 plus and a little bit of C2O4 to minus. Uh, so notice here that this is, and we'll use this quite a bit. So this is, uh, what's the stoichiometry here? So take a look at it and tell me 
uh, what's the stoichiometry or tell yourself and you see that all of the coefficients here are one so it's one to one to one uh, next slide so when an excess of a slightly soluble salt is mixed with water we get an equilibrium so come down uh, just past the halfway point uh, or we'll actually stop where it's bold. The equilibrium constant for this process is called the solubility product constant. So let's stop here for just a second. So it's KSP sub SP, where the SP stands for solubility product. So it's just another kind of equilibrium constant like KC or KP. Uh, in this case, though, it's going to have a different form. Uh, so look just under that that we just read. Uh, CaC2O4 breaks up into Ca2 plus and C2O4 minus. It should be 2 minus there. Uh, that's a, a typo. But notice what happens when we set this up as an equilibrium expression. We have KSP equals products over reactants. But in this case, the products are going to be there, but the reactants aren't. Because if why? Because if you look at the left hand side of that equilibrium, it's a solid. And when we write the equilibrium expressions, we leave out the solids and the pure liquids. So we leave out that CaC2O4. Now that's going to be the case for everything in this chapter. So we wind up with just KSP equals the concentration of the calcium ion times the concentration of the oxalate ion. And there's nothing on the bottom. So this isn't a quotient. It's a product only. So that's why some people just call this K instead of calling it the solubility product constant. They just call it the solubility product. So you'll have to watch this because some of the problems may just call it that. And it'll throw you off if you weren't prepared for it. So it's a constant. And it can be called the solubility product constant, but sometimes I guess lazy chemists just want to shorten it. So they just call it the solubility product. And the reason that they call it the solubility product is because it's just a product. Next slide. Uh, so in general, the solubility product constant is the equilibrium constant for the solubility equilibrium of a either slightly soluble or insoluble compound uh, which to uh, if you want to review what the definitions of those were uh, it's given a few slides back so anything basically less than 0 0.1 molar would include both of these categories next slide <clears throat> the solubility product equals the product of the equilibrium concentrations uh, the one that we just did had stoichiometry of 1 to 1 to 1 so it was just the calcium times the oxalate, both raised, however, to the first power. We didn't really notice that because we don't usually write the one. But if one of those were two or three, then they would have to be raised to that power. So uh, whenever, um, and so I'm clicking here, uh, each concentration is raised to a power equal to the number of such ions. In other words, what the coefficient is. Next slide. For example, okay, so here's one that's different, lead iodide. So lead iodide is a solid, lead is 2 plus, uh, and so iodine is 1 minus. So that means that to match up with the lead 2 plus, we have to have two iodides. Uh, so the formula for that salt will be PBI2. So this is not 1 to 1 to 1, because when it breaks up, PBI2 becomes 1 PB, PB2 plus plus two I minuses, right? Can you see that? So it's not one to one to one. So the solubility product constant will be the products uh, over the reactants, which in this case will be the lead two plus multiplied by the I minus, but the I minus has to be raised to the second power. So if you look at the bottom, it's got KSP equals PB two plus concentration times the concentration of the I minus squared. Now, this is not really that hard to see because this is the same thing we've been doing all semester, right? However, notice one more thing, and we'll come back to this, but 
when you have an amount that's breaking up and you don't know how much it is, like in some problems, they might give you the concentration, uh, a numerical value for the concentration of the lead and the iodide. So all you would do would be to come to the bottom here where it says KSP equals PB2 plus concentration times the concentration of I minus squared. And you would just substitute in the numbers instead of PB2 plus and I minus. But if you don't know what the numbers are, you have to use algebra, which means you have to use the axis. And what's going to happen is you're going to wind up under the, if you go back up, up to the equilibrium, uh, under the lead 2 plus, you'll start with zero typically, although in some cases you won't, uh, and you'll have plus x and zero plus x is x. But for the iodide, you won't have that. You'll have zero plus 2x is 2x. And so you then stick that 2x down in the bottom there where it has the KSP expression in the I minus concentration. So instead of the I minus concentration, you're going to have 2x. But that still has to be squared. So instead of having a, a number squared, you'll have 4x squared. So the point here is that you have to do two different things whenever you have like a 2 in front of something or a 3 in front of something. You First of all, if you have to use algebra to figure out the, the uh, algebraic for, forms of the concentrations, then you're going to have to use 2x rather than x or 3x. Uh, and then you still have to raise those to the second or third power. The reason you have to do it both of those is because raising it to the power of two or three has to do with the, with the equilibrium expression. But the other part where you have to add 2x or 3x has to do with what the concentration would be that you're then going to raise to the second or third power. Next slide. Okay, so let's do the first part, calculating K from a known solubility or molarity or concentration. Next slide. So uh, first of all, we're going back to calcium oxalate, which that's easy to see because it is one to one to one. Uh, we have a one liter sample of a saturated oxalate solution, and it has uh, 0 0.0061 grams of calcium oxalate in one liter. That doesn't really help us any to find the KSP because we need the molarity. <clears throat> so we have to find the molar mass for calcium oxalate. And then we have to figure out how many moles that concentration, uh, how many moles that calcium oxalate amount would translate to. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Uh, next slide. So 0 0.0061 grams is what we were given in the problem statement, uh, divided by 128 grams per mole, or multiplied by one mole over 128 grams, and that gives us 4.8 times 10 to the minus fifth moles. So we've converted the grams to moles of calcium oxalate. And that is dissolved in one liter, so that means that the concentration also will be 4.8 times 10 to the minus fifth molar. Uh, next slide. So again, I rewrote the equilibrium across the top of the ice table. Initial change equilibrium, we're uh, starting with zero. We're assuming here that we're putting this salt into water, and we're assuming that we're at the very beginning of this, so no salt has dissolved. So um, <clears throat> we start with zero for both the calcium and the oxalate. And in this case, we know what the amount that dissolves is. So we don't have to worry about the algebra or the x's. We just write the number in. And it's 1 to 1 to 1, so we don't have to square anything. So uh, just write plus 4.8 times 10 to the minus fifth for both of them. So your equilibrium concentrations will be the same for both, 4.8 times 10 to the minus fifth molar. So your KSP will be 4.8 times 10 to the minus fifth squared. Uh, so next slide, which is going to be 2.3 times 10 to the minus ninth. 
Okay, so we just used the molarity or the concentration or the solubility to figure out the constant. Uh, next slide. Uh, another example which is more difficult because we have something that's going to break up such that it's not gonna it's not gonna have a one to one to one stoichiometry. So in this case we have lead iodide. This we've looked at this a moment ago. PBI2 will break up into PB2 plus plus I minus, but there have to be two of the I minuses. Uh, so in this case, across the top of the ice table, we just write uh, PBI2 breaking up into PB2 plus plus 2I minus. Again, we assume that we're starting at zero. Um, and now look back at the problem statement at top. It's 1.2 times 10 to the minus third moles of lead iodide, and it's in one liter. So that means that the concentration of the lead iodide would be 1.2 times 10 to the minus third molar. Uh, when it breaks up, though, look at the formula for the lead iodide. It will break up into only one lead. So for every PBI2 that breaks up, it will produce one PB2+, which means the concentration of the PB2+, will be the same as the concentration of the PBI2. In other words, the concentration will be 1.2 times 10 to the minus third. But for the iodide, look back at the formula for this salt. PBI2 will break up into one PB, but two I minuses, right? So we have to multiply 1.2 times 10 to the minus third times two, which is 2.4 times 10 to the minus third to get the concentration for the iodide. So at equilibrium, we'll have a concentration for the lead, two plus, of 1.2 times 10 to the minus third, and for the iodide, we'll have a concentration of 2.4 times 10 to the minus third. Next slide. Um, next slide. But then notice here at the top, we still have to square the concentration, even though we've already multiplied it by 2. Uh, so it went from 1.2 to 2.4. We still have to square it because, again, the squaring comes from the equilibrium expression. Uh, so at the bottom, if we multiply 1.2 times 10 to the minus third times 2.4 times 10 to the minus third squared, we get our answer, uh, which is the K value. So again, we've used the um, solubility or the molarity of the salt to determine what its K is. Um, all right, so in the answer is 6.9 times 10 to the minus ninth. Um, uh, so this one was a little bit more difficult simply because we didn't have a one-to-one-to-one -one -to -one correspondence. Next slide. Uh, so just very briefly here, again, we've, we've talked about this before. The constant itself is a constant, so it will not change unless you change the temperature. The solubility is just the concentration, so it can change uh, depending on, uh, you know, uh, how much of the liquid you, how much water you have, or other factors can change it. So it isn't a constant. Next slide. Let's go now in the reverse direction and find, uh, if we know what the KSP is, find the solubility. So next slide. Next slide. Next slide. <clears throat> All right. If the solubility, I don't know why this is, this is not working too well. If the solubility product constant is known, we can go in the reverse direction and find the solubility. Next slide. Next slide. Uh, and then it says here that the water solubility, okay, so what they're saying here is that once we find the solubility, we'll find it in moles per liter, right? Because that's what we always use. If they specifically want to know something that's referred to as the water solubility, then they want it not in moles per liter, but in grams per liter. So you just have to take a second and do that one last step. Uh, you'll have to figure out whatever it is you're, you figured out the molarity of, 
you'll have to then get the molar mass of it real quick and multiply that times the moles per liter. So moles per liter times uh, grams per mole will give you grams per liter. Uh, that isn't something you're likely to see very much, but just so you'll know how to do it. Next slide. All right, so first problem is, problem is calculate the solubility of silver chloride if we know what the constant is. All right, so again, we're going in the opposite direction. Let's look at this before we flip the slide. Uh, what's the formula? So in your mind, try to picture what's the formula going to be for silver chloride. Uh, so we know silver is always plus one, even though it's a transition metal. Uh, chloride's always what? Minus one. So what's the formula for silver chloride? Uh, AgCl, right? Just AgCl. Put it in water, it breaks up into just Ag plus plus Cl minus. One to one to one. All right, so if we don't know what the number value is for the solubilities, which we don't, right? Because they didn't give them to us. They gave us the K instead. Uh, all right, so we have to figure the number out. We have to therefore use algebra. It's all we can do. So uh, we're going to start off assuming that we're at the very beginning of this process. We just put the silver chloride in the water, right? <clears throat> so assume that the silver concentration is zero and the same thing for the chloride. All right, so what are we going to have in our ice table? And we'll look at it in a second. Uh, we're going to start off with 0 plus x is x for the silver and 0 plus x is x for the chloride because we're not going to have any 2s or 3s here. So it's going to be x times x equals k, or in other words, x squared equals k. Uh, and then to solve that uh, algebraic equation, we just take the square root of both sides. Uh, so the square root of x squared is x, and the square root of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10th is about 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5th. Next slide. Next slide. Next slide. I'm having a hard time getting this thing to move over. So here's the ice table. Very simple. Uh, the KSP expression is just going to be the concentration of Ag+. Plus times the concentration of Cl minus. Uh, we end up with x squared equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus 10th, uh, and take the square root of both sides, and we get that x is 1.3 times 10 to the minus 5th molar. Uh, so that's the molarity. It's also the solubility. Next slide. Calculate the molar solubility of silver phosphate in water. So. Uh, take a look at this. Is this going to be the same type problem, or is it different? So look at it for just a second. I mean, I know the KSP is different, but that, I'm not referring to that. So what's the formula for silver phosphate? Or what's the formula for phosphate? Uh, PO4, 3 minus. So this problem is going to be harder. Uh, so how many silvers, which are plus 1, do we have to have? to match up with a phosphate? Well, we have to have three, right? So the formula will be Ag3PO4. Uh, and that means that it's going to be harder. OK, so before we flip uh, to the next slide, let's just think about what's going to happen. We're going to do it the same way. So we're going to know what K is, but we don't know what the solubilities are. So for silver, it'll be just 0 plus x is x, right? Uh, but for the phosphate, it will be 0 plus 3x is 3x. So at the bottom on the equilibrium line, we're going to have x under silver and 3x under phosphate. And then again, your KSP expression will be KSP equals the concentration of the silver to the first power times the concentration of the phosphate to the third power. Um, so we're going to have to raise 3x to the third power and then multiply it by x. What's 3 to the third power? Well, 3 times 3 times 3 is 27, and x to the third power is x to the third. So 27x to the third multiplied by x is 27x to the fourth, and that's going to equal KSP, which is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 18th. Uh, so you'll have to solve that for x, and that will give you the solubility 
of the salt itself, which is silver phosphate. And it will also give you the solubility for the phosphate because there's only one phosphate in every silver phosphate. Uh, so to do that problem, what we're going to have to do is divide both sides of the equation by 27 to start with. And then we have to take the fourth root of both sides. So you'll want to check on your calculator to make sure that you know how to take the fourth root of something. Next slide. So here we have what I just said. Uh, if you look at the chart, under the silver, we have 3x. Under the phosphate, we have x. Um, and so, uh, actually, I think I may have said that backwards. But anyway, so under the silver, we have 3x. And under the phosphate, we have x. Uh, so the KSP expression will be uh, 3x quantity cubed times x. Uh, and that's going to equal 27x to the fourth, which is what we said. And that equals the k value here, which is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 18th. All right, so first of all, look at that equation. Divide both sides by 27. And then whatever you get on the left-hand side, you want to take the fourth root of that. And then on the right-hand side, you'll have x to the fourth. Take the fourth root of that. And you get x equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus fifth molar. Uh, and that is the molar solubility for silver phosphate. Uh, it also will be the molarity of the phosphate. But it won't be the molarity of the silver because the silver will break up into three times that. So to get the, the um, concentration of the silver plus, you have to multiply 1.6 times 10 to the minus fifth times three. Next slide. All right, so here's the concept check. In comparing several salts at a given temperature, does a higher KSP value mean a higher solubility? Uh, all right, the answer to this is yes, if you have salts that break up into the same number of particles. So do you understand what I'm saying? So the higher the KSP value, the higher the solubility. So if you have, for example, sodium chloride and sodium bromide, they are both going to break up into two particles. Uh, so if the sodium chloride KSP is higher, actually, it probably um, I don't even know if they would calculate a KSP for that because it ha it isn't an insoluble salt. So it's maybe not the best example. But so, for example, if you had silver iodide and silver chloride, uh, and if the silver chloride KSP value were higher than the KI value, uh, sorry, the AGI value, then it would also have a higher sol solubility. So basically, the higher the KSP, the higher the solubility. However, for these kinds of salts, uh, it doesn't always work that way because sometimes you would have like PBI2 where it breaks up into more particles. So that will also increase the solubility. So the answer to this question is, it depends also on how many particles the salts break up into. Next slide. Next. Next slide. I'm having a hard time getting it to go. Uh, so the answer really is no. Uh, it depends on how many particles they break up into. At the bottom, uh, for a binary salt, the KSP will equal S squared. That's the same thing as x squared. Sometimes they'll call this s for solubility rather than x. They're the same thing. Uh, for a ternary salt, though, you have 4x squared times x or 4s squared times s, which is going to give you 4s to the third power or 4x to the third power. Next slide. So for example, Compare the solubilities for th these three salts. So at the top, uh, and then it says, which is the most soluble in water? All right, so at the top, calcium carbonate, two particles. It only breaks up into two. Silver bromide, two particles. Uh, but for the calcium fluoride, it breaks up into three particles. Now, if they all broke up into the same number of particles, then calcium carbonate would have the highest solubility, right? Because it's got the largest constant. But if we also take into account the fact that they break up into different numbers of particles, if you go ahead and figure out the solubilities by doing them 
as we just did the others, the examples, we see that the solubility for CaF2 is actually higher. Its KSP value was lower, but it breaks up into three particles, and the other two only break up into two particles, and that makes a big difference. So it turns out that the calcium fluoride has the highest solubility. Next slide. All right, and this is a new topic. I'm going to pause again for just a second. I'll be Okay, another problem, the mineral fluorite, and this is not fluoride, this is a mineral, uh, has the formula CaF2. Uh, calculate the solubility of the calcium fluoride. In other words, we just have to find our X, right, in water uh, from the KSP. Okay, so again, this will be done the same way we've been doing these. So I just went ahead and gave you the answer here. Here's the ice table. Uh, we start off with zero in both cases. Uh, for calcium, every time CaF2 breaks up in water, it will produce one calcium 2 plus ion. So we add plus 1x equals x, but it will break up into 2f minus ions. So we add plus 2x, 0 plus 2x is 2x. Now what are you going to do to solve the rest of the problem? Multiply x times 2x quantity squared equals 3.4 times 10 to the minus 11th. Next slide. Uh, next slide. So in the middle here, 3.4 times 10 to the minus 11th equals x times 2x quantity squared. Uh, solve that for x, just as we've been doing, and we get 2 times 10 to the minus 4th. All right, what does that stand for? It stands for the concentration of uh, the CaF2 that is going to be, uh, it's going to be the solubility, the amount of that that will dissolve is uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 4. So the solubility, we say, of the calcium fluoride is 2 times 10 to the minus 4th. Now, they asked for this one as far as the water solubility rather than the molar solubility. So it's not a big deal here. The main thing is to get this number, this 2 times 10 to the minus 4th. If we wanted to convert it to grams, we just have to find the molar mass for calcium fluoride and multiply 2 times 10 to the minus 4th times that number. Next slide. So it's done kind of like halfway down. It turns out that the calcium fluoride has a molar mass of 78, roughly. So 2 times 10 to the minus 4th times 78.1 is 0.016 grams in a liter. That's grams per liter, uh, so we call that the water solubility. The main thing that I want you to see here is not this uh, water solubility. It's how to do these problems. Uh, so, all right, uh, and so the deal is here is that uh, don't get confused about the fact that you have to uh, do manipulations twice if you have a two or a three in the stoichiometry. It's just, that's just the way it happens. Okay, so you have to multiply, first of all, by a two or a three because that's going to give you the concentrations. And then those concentrations in turn will then have to be squared or cubed or whatever. Uh, all right, so let's go to the next slide. Okay, the common ion effect is something we have already studied in Chapter 17a uh, for buffer solutions. We found that if we added a common ion, we could cause equilibria to go to the left. In other words, the solubility for this chapter would be less. So, in other words, this is a way that we could actually decrease the solubility. Why would we want to do that? Well, sometimes if you have something in a solution, like, for example, if you're trying to precipitate out something like silver chloride, you might want to keep the uh, equilibrium to the left. In other words, you might want to try to keep it from dissociating. Uh, because for whatever reason, you want silver chloride, right? Then you can add a common ion to that. Uh, and in the case of silver chloride, you wouldn't want to add silver because it would be expensive. But... Uh, you could cheaply add Cl- to that equilibrium. Uh, 
And it'll do the same thing it did in chapter 17a, right? It will uh, cause the equilibrium to shift to the left. Uh, so this is really the only technique we'll study that will decrease the solubility. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, next slide. Next. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. For example, suppose you wish to know the solubility of calcium fluoride, but you have a solution that already has some sodium fluoride in it. Right. So uh, what we're concerned about here is the equilibrium with calcium fluoride. Uh, so let's just think about in our minds what that would be. Uh, so what's the formula going to be for calcium fluoride? You, you can probably figure this out, right? It's CaF2. What's that going to break up into in water? So you write CaF2, double-headed arrow, Ca2 plus, plus 2F minus. Okay, so that's the equilibrium we care about. What would happen, though, if we put this into a solution and there's already already some sodium fluoride in the solution? Well, the sodium makes no difference because it's not in that equilibrium that we care about, but the fluoride does. Okay, so because there's already some fluoride in the solution, when we make our ice table, we're going to have a number in the first row where we're in the initial conditions, not zero. You see what I'm saying? So let's go to the next slide. So the, actually it's on the same slide, the NAF contributes fluoride uh, and it will shift the equilibrium to the left because it's a common ion. Okay, next slide. So the net effect is that the calcium fluoride will be less soluble than it would be in pure water. Next slide. Uh, so what is the molar solubility of calcium fluoride? in 0.15 molar sodium fluoride. So this is actually an example that, of what we talked about in the previous slide, right? And then they give us the KSP here for calcium fluoride. So the equilibrium that we care about here is calcium fluoride, which is CaF2, breaks up into Ca2 plus plus 2F minus. Uh, we've already mentioned this, but we have to take into account that we already have 0 0.15 molar sodium fluoride. So we uh, do our ice table as we've done them in the past, but now rather than having zeros across the top, we're starting off with 0 0.15 at the top for the F minus. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the time, which has just kind of gone crazy. Uh, I'm not sure why it's switched over and started over again. But anyway, uh, it may have started over when I paused it. Uh, but that, that can't be what happened. So I'm not sure what's going on with the time. Uh, anyway, uh, so the only difference here is that we're going to start with 0 0.15 rather than 0. Uh, and then, again, we have to uh, write 2x under the F minus rather than x because there's a 2 in front of the F in the equilibrium expression. So notice here we're going to wind up with 0 plus x is x for calcium 2 plus. But for F minus, we have 0 0.15 plus 2x. Uh, and then what we'll do is what we've done in the past, right? We'll assume that the 2x is negligible. Uh, so we just have 0 0.15 and forget the 2x. Uh, and then that has to be again squared because of the uh, 2 for the equilibrium expression. So write your KSP and set it equal to the products, uh, their, their product of the products. Uh, so CA 2 plus times F minus squared uh, which would be x times 0 0.15 squared, which is 0 0.0225 times x. 
uh, and then solve that for x, and you get that x is about 2.2 uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 9th molar. All right, so the only difference for this one is that we already had some of the f minus at the beginning. Common ion, uh, but notice here that our solubility now is less than it would have been if we just had this in pure water. And that's because the solubility decreases. Okay, next line. Uh, precipitation calculations, next line. Okay, so precipitation is merely another way of looking at solubility. Uh, rather than asking how much of a substance will dissolve, we ask how much, uh, or rather, what will precipitation occur for a given starting ion. Uh, to determine whether an equilibrium system will go in the forward or reverse direction, we have to look again at Q, which is something we talked about in Chapter 15. Uh, which here it's called uh, the uh, ion product or the product. Uh, we call it Q in chapter 15. So to predict the direction of the reaction, we compare the Q with the KSP. If the Q is less than KSP, uh, then that means that more of whatever the salt is can dissolve. If it equals KSP, that means we're exactly at equilibrium. And if it's more than KSP, it means somehow we've gone past the amount, the maximum amount that we can dissolve and it's super saturated. And so some of it will have to come out of solution. Okay, so um, the Q here has the same form as the K. In other words, we do it the same way that we did the KSP but it's not at equilibrium, so we can't write an equilibrium expression. But we can figure out what the value of Q is. Uh, so let's go to the next slide. So if we have this uh, equilibrium, we have PbCl2 gives Pb2 plus plus 2Cl minus, then the K expression would be the concentration of Pb2 plus times the concentration of Cl minus squared. And so the Q expression is the same, except that we cannot now set that equal to the KSP. So uh, all we're doing here is we're finding out what the Q would be, but it's not equilibrium. Okay, it's not at equilibrium. Uh, next slide. So if Q equals KSP, the solution is saturated. The solution is at the precipitation point. Any more added solute will produce a precipitate. Uh, if Q is less than KSP, more solute can dissolve. And if Q is greater than KSP, then we get precipitation. OK, uh, I'm showing this is the last slide. And I thought there were a few more. Uh, so I don't know what happened. Uh, so we still have to talk about a couple of things like if you want to increase the solubility. Uh, so there are two ways you can do that. You can add a ligand, which will cause a complex ion. Uh, you can do that in some cases where you have a product like silver plus. And then another way that you can increase solubility is if one of the products happens to be the conjugate base of a weak acid, then you can add H plus to that. In other words, add HCl. And what that will do will be to produce the original weak acid, which is not in the equilibrium uh, proper. So that will actually remove that product from the equilibrium and cause the equilibrium to shift to the right. Now, uh, there are various reasons why you might want to do this. Uh, so. We're, uh, I'm not sure what happened with those slides. There were just a couple more slides that I was going to go through. Uh, however, uh, if those slides are not on here, I'm showing that I'm out of slides down at the bottom. Uh, so if those slides are not on here, if they are, I'll go ahead and talk about them. If they're not, we're going to uh, discuss these anyway uh, extensively in the work problems. So I'm going to go ahead and try to flip to the next slide if there is one. Uh, 
If there's not, then this will be the end of this, so I'll see you in the worked problems.